नमस्कार व्यूअर्स हेलो एंड वेलकम टू सनसेट टीवी आई एम टीना झा यूर वॉचिंग परस्पेक्टिव वर्ल्ड लीडर्स हैव गैदर्ड फॉर द हाई लेवल डिबेट एट द सेवेंटी सेवन सेशन ऑफ द यूनाइटेड नेशन जनरल असेंबली दिस ईयर सेशन विच कम्स आफ्टर टू ईयर्स ऑफ डिस्ट्रप्शन ड्यू टू द कोविड पैंडमिक इज बेस्ड ऑन द थीम अ वाटर शेड मोमेंट ट्रांसफॉर्मेटिव सोल्यूशन टू इंटरलॉकिंग चैलेंजेस लीडिंग द इंडियन डेलीगेशन एट द यू एन जी एस सेशन दिस ईयर इज एक्सटर्नल अफेयर्स मिनिस्टर डॉक्टर एस जयशंकर He will address world leaders from the UNGA podium on the 24th of September. On Monday, he met the president of the 77th session of the UNGA, Shaba Qureshi, and reiterated India's deep commitment to multilateralism. In fact, he also discussed the criticality of sustainable development goals agenda for global progress. What are going to be his focus areas when he addresses the UNGA on Saturday? What are some of the pressing issues before the world that are expected to take center stage at the UNGA session this year? this and much more in perspective today with an illustrious panel of experts please to welcome on this edition of perspective former ambassador mr ashok sajjanhar mr harshvi pant vice president studies and foreign policy orf and mr pramit pal choudhury foreign affairs editor hindustan times thank you gentlemen for joining me on the program today uh, mr choudhury let me begin the program today with you you know the unga is an opportunity for the world to come together address the most pressing challenges that face the world now you know at a time when the world is facing a host of challenges uh, an ongoing war there is of course the aftermath and disruption caused by the pandemic what are some of the most pressing global issues that you think are going to dominate this particular session with well, the un secretary general antonio guterres has already light uh, put them out uh, the obvious one is the russia ukraine conflict uh and we will see the ukrainian uh, president uh, vladimir zelensky actually speak to the unga um and that conflict continues to if you wish uh, permeate almost every element uh, of the international system uh the, the biggest global crisis we're clearly face, facing which is a sort of combination of the war and climate change um is climate change itself we're seeing you know enormous flooding for example in pakistan droughts in europe um yeah even pro- uh, problems with our monsoon in india uh but it that combined with the war is resulting in enormous inflationary food and fuel price problems across the world um and then uh, finally on top of that we have as he has mentioned polarization as an issue global polarization Uh, partly because of the war but also because of the internal stresses that many governments are facing now uh as a consequence of the economic uh, recession that is very clearly going to be is starting to spread across the world so there's a whole host of problems the problem <clears throat> the, the the real issue is how do you resolve them given that the united nations is so deeply divided now especially the security council because of the war in ukraine which comes on top of existing tensions between for example the quad members and china uh there has been probably no more deeply divided united nations um since uh, probably the cold war uh but unfortunately the problems it faces are 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 considerable its ability to resolve them however <clears throat> is, is is deeply reduced Absolutely ambassador you know in this deeply polarized world differences between world powers have been sharpening over the last couple of months or so what uh, are some of the critical issues that you expect india to focus on when uh, dr s jay shankar speaks at the unga podium on saturday this uh, particular session of the unga the 77th session of the unga i think is also very significant uh, and uh, i think it also Uh, is reflected in the number of heads of state and government who will be participating in person because this is uh, the UNGA session which is taking place in person after uh, uh, three years in 2019 we had the last UNGA session and after that it has been basically virtual interactions that have been taking place uh, on the UNGA platform so this is the first time that uh, heads of state and heads of government are coming together and as per uh, reports we have more than 100 heads of state and government and of course large number of vice presidents and foreign ministers who will be participating so i think this uh, reflects uh, what uh, uh, the increased attention and importance that the world community is giving to discussions here uh, in the unga session as far as india is concerned uh, there are a number of issues that uh, 
we have been uh, raising in uh, various uh, multilateral and plurilateral fora. Tina, and I think uh, uh, one of the first, the topmost would be in terms of uh, reform of uh, multilateralism. And, you know, this brings me to also what uh, Pramit mentioned just now, that uh, while the challenges uh, continue uh, apace, challenges uh, confronting the global community are huge and uh, many, but uh, because of uh, the fact that uh, the multilateral system today, you know, whether we look at it in terms of uh, dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, which started at the beginning of 2020, we saw how broken uh, the WHO was in terms of coming uh, to uh, terms with it, coming to, uh, uh, to deal with this particular challenge. And so even at that time, uh, the Prime Minister has spoken about uh, reform of uh, multilateralism. There are a large number of agencies. We've seen also the World Trade Organization is not functioning. And most importantly, the UN Security Council is uh, failed to function. Basically, because it was constructed in 1945, it uh, reflected uh, the uh, position, the situation as it existed after the Second World War in 1945. But since 1945 and after more than 75 years, there have been a large number of changes in uh, the global uh, equation of uh, power. There are so many other countries that have risen in uh, economic, political, military significance and uh, so many others which have come down. But uh, there has been no significant change as far as uh, uh, the UN Security Council, which is the body which determines the, uh, uh, the security and the stability in the world. So there are no changes there that have taken place. India has been mentioning, has been uh, putting forward its own very strong credentials for a permanent membership of the UN Security Council, along with other countries, Germany, Japan, uh, and uh, uh, South Africa. So G4 has been uh, uh, putting forward its case. So I think reform of the multilateral system is definitely going to be on uh, one of the key issues. Then uh, we also find uh, the issue of terrorism, because uh, here we have uh, found that uh, uh, terrorism is uh, 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 in increasingly, it is posing a problem, it is posing a challenge. We've seen what is happening in Afghanistan, and we have also seen in the UN Security Council, maybe uh, without uh, mentioning uh, names, because there are uh, blocks that are put to, uh, uh, to designation of international terrorists. So the fact that there should be no uh, two ways, uh, no uh, hypocrisy as far as uh, dealing with uh, terrorism is concerned, there are no good terrorists, no bad terrorists, that definitely, I think, will also come up. And lastly, if I may say, also the issue of uh, climate change, because that is an existential threat as far as global peace, security, and stability and prosperity is concerned. And uh, this is uh, an area where India has done exceedingly well, whether it is in terms of establishing the International Solar Alliance or the Coalition of Disaster Resilient uh, Infrastructure Initiative, uh, uh, India is one of the uh, very few, if not the only country which is meeting its uh, Paris commitments. So I think uh, India is, will definitely raise uh, this particular issue. And of course, there are many others like peacekeeping and uh, uh, bringing uh, stability and security, which India will participate. Certainly, in Ambassador. Manner. So a yeah. host of these issues that you've cited, which most probably will be discussed <coughs> and will be raised by Dr. S.J. Shankar when he takes the UNGA podium on Saturday. Professor Pant, uh, one of the most important aspects and that the Prime Minister has also, you know, raised on several occasions has been the reforms of multilateral forums. The irony is that the theme this year is a watershed moment, transformative solutions to interlocking challenges. But all of these multilateral forums, which are supposed to provide solutions, we've seen over the last couple of years how the world has been faced, uh, you know, uh, uh, with one challenge or the other. And all of these organizations have been mute spectators. Now, of course, India will be pitching for these reforms, but do you see solid support coming in from other world powers as well, especially at a time when we talk about peace? And it, this happens to be uh, one of the major stumbling blocks to peace. 
Uh, indeed, Tina, I think, you know, the, the title of this year's um, uh, <coughs> conference meeting, uh, summit meeting is Watershed Moment. It is indeed a watershed moment uh, in, in many respects because uh, we have had COVID, we have had wars, we have had uh, major power tensions, major power polarization, and that is impacting the way uh, the world is being governed. And you can see that the global governance is at its very nadir at, at this point. Uh, where, uh, you know, even seemingly uh, innocuous things like health governance uh, seem to be out of the control of, sort of mainstream multilateral institutions. So I think we have seen a decay, gradual decay of these institutions happening over the last few years, over the last few decades, in fact. But this is a moment, I think, which encapsulates the challenges in ways uh, that, uh, that perhaps the last year wouldn't have, because we have had now a major conflict like Russia-Ukraine conflict right at the doorstep of, of Europe. Uh, so what I think uh, this moment represents uh, for the international community also is a moment of reckoning because major powers are polarizing the system as they've always done. But I think the brunt is being borne uh, by uh, developing world, by, the, by uh, you know, the, the most vulnerable, some of the most vulnerable. And this cuts across issue domains, whether you're looking at energy crisis, food crisis, climate crisis, some of the, the, the challenges are being, uh, you know, the, the way uh, shaped uh, uh, and, and impacted upon the, the most vulnerable is quite striking. So one has to acknowledge that this is indeed a watershed moment. And the, the question is whether there is enough uh, political will at this point and whether there is enough, uh, you know, uh, capacity in some ways uh, available that, that one can harness and make this, this multilateral framework work. India, of course, has been talking of reform multilateralism, but I think what is also striking is, is what is, you know, on, on Dr. Jay Shankar's plate, apart from the UN General Assembly, because he's also participating in, uh, he's likely to participate in the Quad meeting, in the SCO, uh, sorry, in, in the BRICS, in IPSA meetings, then you have the host of trilaterals uh, with other, uh, you know, uh, with other member states which I think tells you an important message in its own right, that you know, the multilateral order, if it, if it continues to perform as badly as it is doing, then nations will have to find alternative mechanisms uh, to, for, for governance. And I think that's the, the rise of minilaterals, plurilaterals, whatever you might say over the last uh, few years uh, is a reflection of that trend, that countries are moving away from, uh, from a United Nations system, if you will where we have seen one institution after another collapse under the weight of their own contradictions. And countries are moving towards like-minded countries, issue-based coalitions, uh, which can work together on a particular domain. And I think if that becomes the norm, then certainly it challenges the, the centrality of the UN and it challenges the way we think of global governance. And, and in, in some ways, that may be the only alternative left if the UN is not functioning. So I think the messages that are coming out are quite categorical that, look, this may be a watershed moment, but what are we doing about it? And if, you, if, if nothing is happening about it, if there is no greater representation, no more voices for, the, for those who are bearing the brunt of, those, of these crises, then you may, I think more and more nations will try to move away from the system to other, other modes of uh, cooperation. And that would be a real issue in terms of what it does to global governance, whether that fractured global governance is something that we can live with uh, in the 21st century. But I think those are questions that this UN General Assembly session will raise in, it, in its own way. And especially how India is interacting with a lot of these issues, how India is engaging with a lot of these platforms. And that is in some ways going to be a marker uh, for India's own attempt uh, and India's own advocacy of reform multilateralism that India has been calling for a very long time. But clearly power politics uh, is, is, is everything. Power politics overrides many of these uh, ideational constructs. And if this continues, if, if the way the world is working continues, if the polarization continues, if the weakening of the global multilateral order continues, uh, then nations like India will have to find alternative mechanisms of moving ahead with, with their own uh, uh, priorities in global governance. And that is, I think, what is also uh, something that the message from uh, India, from several other countries, in fact, will be. Absolutely. Mr. Chaudhary, not just India, the fact that several countries, like-minded countries, are drifting away from this multilateral system because uh, th there is a growing sense that uh, issues that uh, pertain to the larger population are not being adequately addressed. They are not receiving the fair amount of attention. If this continues, it's going to be a problem for these multilateral organizations and perhaps reforms is the need of the hour. But the fact that these issues will be raised at the UNGA, what next? Does anything concrete happen after that? Um, right now, I would just suspect very little uh, because I've mentioned, as we've all mentioned, the UN is unusually internally divided. 
Uh, its main effort now will have to be to try and figure out how to try to resolve the war uh, or at least begin preparing the ground for a possible negotiated settlement of the Russia-Ukraine war. Right now, that doesn't seem likely uh, in a hurry, but the, the, the preparatory work, uh, I think, has to begin. Uh, we've seen the president of Mexico, for example, issue, I think, a statement urging that Prime Minister Modi, the Pope, um, and I think the UN Secretary General be considered for a mediation effort. It was rejected by Ukraine, obviously, because Ukraine is doing quite well on the, on the battleground, and so therefore is not interested in the media, mediation at this point. But at some point, we hope that the two sides will become too tired to continue fighting, at which point uh, the window must will open, and at which point an organization like the UN uh, and the world community must be ready to step in and begin that process. That's one element of it. Second element is I think we need, there has to be a look at how to handle climate transition. Uh, we've massively underinvested in oil and gas and fossil fuels, and now we're facing an enormous shortage of them, even while we are not yet ready to switch to re fully into renewable energy. So some sort of transitory structure needs to be worked out, and I'm hoping at the G20 we'll see which India chairs next year, we'll see some work on that, uh, on the, on that front. Um, there'll be, and there'll be other issues. I mean, what we're seeing, for example, is that Europe, for example, has decided we won't buy Russian gas because of the war, that's fine, but the, what are they doing? They're buying that gas from other parts of the world, which is making gas prices skyrocket because it's simply not enough for everybody. Um, so we have a whole host of these problems that continue to be to, to, to linger or to that have to be somehow resolved. So I guess, don't see the UN resolving them any, at any time point soon, not right now. The, the stars, if you wish, are not in alignment. But the good thing about the UN, at the, which is what we'll hopefully see, is that a lot of governments will begin the process of talking with each other, that when we are in a position to mediate, when we are in a position to actually do some serious work, climate, are, what are you going to do and what are your positions? and then slowly begin that long and uh, bottoms up approach and diplomacy of trying to work out where at least the major countries are. That I suspect is one reason you'll see uh, uh, Dr. Jai Shankar, our foreign minister, spend, he's gonna be spending almost over 11 days or 11 days in, in the United States, most of it the UNGA, because he's preparing the ground for because of the fact that we will chair the SCO, we will chair the G20, we probably will chair the Quad Summit for the first time in the latter half of next year if there's a second summit. Uh, so we will have to do a lot of work in, in preparing for that. And India's good strong point is not nobody really wildly opposed to us. We are almost every door uh, is open to India right now, uh, even China. Okay, Ambassador, a related question on the UNSC reform, something that India has been pitching for several years now. The larger question here is, and this is something that the External Affairs Minister has often spoken about in India, also in other countries as well, that the fact that India in a couple of years will be the most populated country in the world, overtaking China, but it will not be represented at the United Nations. What does it say about the credibility, about the relevance of the global body? I think the dis uh, discussions and talks on uh, reform of the uh, United Nations Security Council and also to get uh, a rightful place for India in the Security Council. Discussions have been going on for a long time. And uh, let's face it, uh, you know, the uh, block there, the resistance there is not from the United States. It's not from the United Kingdom. It's not from France. It's not even from Russia. I think uh, uh, people do realize, countries do realize that one major stumbling block has been uh, China. Because uh, you would recall that when uh, uh, President Barack Obama came to India in 2010 and he had announced uh, on the floor of these, uh, you know, uh, the, while addressing the joint session of the Indian Parliament, that the United States is uh, supportive of India's uh, place in the UN Security Council. And the other permanent members have also voiced similar statements and similar feelings. It's only China, which, uh, you know, as a veto wielding member, which is as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, has been standing in the way. I, I think if that were out, then definitely it would not really be all that much of a problem for India to get uh, the two thirds majority in the UN General Assembly to get its uh, place in the UN Security Council. Of course, the 
further details, whether with a veto, without a veto, uh, for a few years without a veto, etc. I think all those are details which uh, need to be worked out, which need to be sorted out. But this is the biggest stumbling block uh, in my view. I think India has been engaging with all countries uh, in the world. Uh, you know, we've been following a policy of multi-alignment and, uh, you know, whether it is the uh, Pacific Island states or it is South America or it is Africa. Our engagement with all these countries has increased very significantly, very substantially over the last uh, seven, eight years, particularly. So I think there will be, uh, I'm, I'm in fact confident and certain that there'll be a huge measure, measure of support for uh, uh, such a change. But uh, again, uh, it, uh, you know, if there is a veto wielding member, and we have seen uh, that uh, as far as China is concerned, how it uh, uh, blocks India's uh, rise and India's progress at every step, whether it is membership of the nuclear suppliers group. You would recall that there are these uh, five uh, uh, fundamental agreements on uh, uh, nuclear uh, 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 non-proliferation and uh, missile control. India has been able to become a member of four of them because China is not represented in those four bodies. In the one single body, that is the NSG in which China is represented, India has not been able to gain entry, again, because uh, China is uh, putting uh, blocks in the way. Similarly, we have seen uh, more recently, you know, any initiative by India, whether it was in terms of designation of Masood Azhar, now Sajid Mir, uh, as the international terrorist, uh, China always uh, blocks that for its own uh, strategic considerations. So I think uh, uh, we uh, and relations between India and China being what they are, I don't foresee any positive uh, development on uh, the, uh, this uh, aspect in the very near future. But of course, we will. Uh, we need to continue to try. You would recall, uh, Tina, that when Prime Minister Modi in September 2014, he had addressed uh, the UNGA, he had said that this is the 70th anniversary of uh, the UNGA, uh, of the establishment of the United Nations, and this is the appropriate time when India should get its rightful place. But we are seven, eight years beyond that. While we need to continue uh, for pursuing that particular objective, I'm not very hopeful that we are able to uh, uh, we'll be able to see a, a fruitful, a positive result. Absolutely. That You're right, being said, there are so many other issues, so many other aspects on which we can work together uh, in the United Nations with a large number of uh, other countries. And that, of course, uh, we need to continue. And that is what I'm sure is going to be the focus when uh, Foreign Minister, External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar speaks and when he engages and interacts with his counterparts from a number of other countries as he is already doing. So certainly these reforms have been spoken about. India has been engaging with like-minded countries, with partners to make sure that it happens. But in case it doesn't, as uh, Professor Pant says, countries will have to find alternatives, will have to engage with each other, have smaller groupings, and perhaps drift away from these multilateral bodies if the reforms do not happen. But coming to, to the other aspect, Professor, the fact that not just these reforms are something that will be spoken about, but also the climate crisis, something that large parts of the world today are reeling under. Uh, the fact that the world has been lagging behind in achieving the SDG targets as well. Uh, do you think that changing geopolitical context, the current geopolitical tensions have in a way pushed us back in achieving the climate targets. Also, the fact that energy security has somewhere taken precedence over climate security, over green transition. I think uh, this has been, um, last few years have been, uh, have, we have seen a shift happening uh, in terms of uh, how nations look at, uh, you know, their economic interactions, their economic priorities, their energy priorities, uh, and, and, you know, in terms of uh, uh, what is happening to the larger climate uh, debate. Uh, I, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very um, um, interesting and ironic that a lot of uh, the challenges that are being felt today when it comes to climate change, when it comes to sustainability, are being felt uh, across the world, they are being felt across the world in in dramatic ways, uh, with, with you know floods, with droughts, with uh, you know the, the the temperatures soaring during during the months. I think this 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 was one of the most uh, uh, remarkable uh, summers in Europe. Uh, 
uh, in the challenge of, of, of that summer and, and the, the kinds of weather patterns that we are witnessing. Uh, and then smaller countries, weaker countries that do not have the ability to protect themselves are of course bearing the brunt of, 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 this, of this calamity. So in an interesting way, this, this is a time when you are, you know, when, when we should be talking more specifically about uh, the, you know, the, the green transition or the climate transition into more sustainable modes. But what is happening is also that the larger geopolitical context is changing so rapidly uh, that uh, the, the, the world is yet to come to terms with this, with this reality of how do you balance your priorities out? So what, what at one point seemed feasible to achieve the, 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 the climate targets, the sustainable development targets by a lot of countries. Uh, today, a lot of the countries are saying, well, we can't do that. And, and I think uh, given, the, given that our priority has to be uh, uh, you know, food security and energy security for, for some of our most vulnerable. So I think the debate has changed because of the, of the larger uh, COVID crisis, uh, you know, Ukraine crisis, the energy and food crisis because as, as a result of that. And that, that takes us in a very different domain at this point. But this is also a point when th those similar issues should also be making us more aware uh, of the climate problem, of the, of, the, of the environmental problems, the sustainability uh, divide that we are witnessing across the world. Absolutely. And perhaps, uh, you know, that is one of the reasons why a number of the smaller countries, number of the I know, island states, for example, are putting a lot of pressure on, on major powers, asking them to do more about, uh, you know, uh, issue, more on issues of climate change. Uh, then uh, and then go to power politics if at all that is needed because for them it's a life and death issue it's an existential problem and, and they need the world to come together to resolve that it's, but unfortunately again, professor and, that's not happening you know, at yeah. a time you know when the scientists are warning that uh, we are running behind achieving climate targets and we must restrict ourselves to you know uh, less than 1.5 degrees celsius uh, the earth should not be warming faster but that is something that has taken backstage the geopolitical tensions have somehow pushed us back uh, uh, in in terms of the SDG targets and uh, countries today are scrambling to fulfill their energy needs, as you rightly said, be it even going back to fossil fuels as we, we are protesting in some parts of Europe. So that is a challenge that, that the world has to look at. And let's see how all of these concerns are raised at the UN General Assembly by world leaders when they start speaking uh, uh, later today. So uh, that having been said, I'll have to wind up the program. Time is running out. Thank you to all three of you for joining us on the program today, sharing your thoughts with us and our viewers. Absolute pleasure to have all three of you on the program once again with us. So viewers, that's it from us on this edition of Perspective. Thank you very much for your time as well. I'll see you same time tomorrow now. Until then, you take good care of yourselves and keep watching Sunset TV.